super exciting event. My name is Heidi Kalu, and I'm the assistant program coordinator here at the Kelly Writers House. Um, and one of the most exciting aspects of my job is that I get the chance to put forth some ideas for programs every year. And tonight's event is one of those programs I proposed. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone at the Writers House for their eagerness and support in organizing tonight's program. Uh, thanks to Allie, Jessica, Andrew, Julia, and Zach, um, to Jim English and Stuart Varner, um, and grand thank yous to our host Amanda and Whitney for their work in structuring and leading our program, um, which is made possible with support from our sponsors Creative Ventures, the Price Lab for Digital Humanities, and Penn Libraries. And lastly, of course, thanks so much to Dr. Nakamura for traveling all the way here to speak with us. Um, now I'd like to introduce our host for the evening, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Amanda LaCostro is the Emerging and Digital Literacy Designer for UPenn Libraries, the Pedagogical Director of, Book Trace, of the Book Traces Project, and serves on the Editorial Collective of the Journal and Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. Her research explores the intersection of technology and writing, including book history, dystopian literature, and extended reality. Her new collection, Composition and Big Data, co-edited with Ben Miller, was just published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Dr. Whitney Tretin is an assistant professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania. She teaches the history of the book and other technologies from print to digital. Her first book, Cut, Copy, Paste, explores amateur publishing with scissors and paste. It was published both in print and digitally through the platform Manifold. Tretin also has also co-edited digital sound studies with a web-based companion for Sonic Scholarship. She is currently working on 19th century histories of computation and digital project on print shops within prisons. Mm -hmm. Join me in welcoming. Can everyone hear me? Apologies, I am losing my voice this evening, but I will do my best. Thank you so much to Kelly Writers House for hosting us this evening and for all of you for coming in the rain tonight. And to all of you online who are joining us virtually. It is an honor to welcome Dr. Lisa Nakamura, who is the Gwendolyn Calvert Baker Collegiate Professor of American Culture at the University of Michigan. She is the author of several books on race, gender, and the internet. She has studied identity tourism in video games and chat rooms, toxic embodiment in virtual reality, and the neglected contributions of women of color to the internet and digital culture. She is the founding director of the Digital Studies Institute at the University of Michigan and the PI for DISCO, which stands for Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism Network, a Mellon Foundation-funded research group focusing on race, digital technology, and disability. Tonight's conversation, we hope, is one that is organic, with a, a lot of free-flowing conversation, but we did send Dr. Nakamura several prompts in advance to get us started. We hope to end early to invite questions from all of you, both here in person and online. So please do put your questions in the chat if you're joining us virtually. And I'm gonna turn it over to Whitney. Thank you, Amanda. Um, everybody can hear me? Awesome. Um, okay, yeah, so I, I just wanted to start off with a reflection on the state of the field and ask you to reflect on it. So we've seen an explosion of interest in race and technology academically with the rise of new subfields like critical algorithm studies, data ethics, but at the same time it would seem that this flourishing of critique has not actually resulted in more just technologies or more responsible tech companies. Um, the, in fact, much of what you describe in your 2002 book, um, the opening lines of which are up here for us, is still relevant. The internet is still a place where race happens, and it's still a place where our ideas about race, ethnicity, and identity continue to be shaped and reshaped every time we log on. Um, so can you reflect on the state of race and technology studies, where it's been, and where the conversation is going as you see it? Yeah, I think that some of the, um works that you and I were talking about in your classes by people like Sophia Noble and Ruha Benjamin and Andre Brock, um, and indigenous network studies by people like Marissa Duarte, who wrote a book called Network Sovereignty about the way that digital infrastructure has been both withheld from reservation lands and also sometimes imposed upon reservation lands. 
I think that these fields are the future. And I think as well, the study of disability and technology is also a frontier. As we saw during Zoom, when all of a sudden people who had been excluded from conversations and even from work could participate all of a sudden, right? So on the one hand, that's the flourishing of critique, I feel, that's going beyond this utopia, everything is great for everyone. Instead, some things are good for some people and not for other people. Um, but I think the state of the field, as I found from talking to your students, is somewhat um, stuck in a feeling of pessimism and disempowerment by users, who on the one hand are often very attached, I mean, I won't use the word addicted, but attached in ways that feel uncomfortable to the digital, um, and yet sometimes unable to feel like they can meaningfully intervene in it. So I feel the critique side is moving in, in great new directions, which it needs to go into. As far as what the technology companies are doing, um, as I wrote in some of, in fact, everything I've written that I can remember, has kind of been about the maneuvers of technology companies to use messaging, symbolism, advertising around things like multiculturalism or around even things like diversity or disability to sell what they're doing, which are in fact somewhat destructive to those very things. So um, I think the state of the field is, is, is good. I think the state of the state or the state of us is more problematic. <laughs> You, you brought up this idea of disability in technology, and I just defined disco mm -hmm. <laughs> for everyone. Can you tell us a little bit more about that project? Yeah, so this is a three-year big grant that's a multi-institutional grant. It just means that there's five different colleges that are splitting this funding. And one of the um, legs of it is uh, Remy Yergo's Disability Accessible, it's her, um, their, it's called the Accessible Futures Re Research Researching Accessible Futures, which means research AF. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's going to focus on the intersection between disability and other technologized identities. So looking at things like um, mental health apps that a lot of students were sent to during COVID. Did anybody here get a request to use a mental health app? There's ones called Balance and there's one there's one called Calm that's an Irish man where you, you meditate and he, we listen to him talk. Um, well, I think these were part of telemedicine, but they're also a way to instrumentalize and operationalize what used to be a different and more human function. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in some ways the internet was always marketed as a prosthesis to make people more whole or more capable, like to cover over the deficiencies of the human and so if you view the human as always already deficient in a way, and technology is instead being the symptom to the kinds of problems or, or you know, um, unacceptable parts of humanity, then it helps me to understand why and how dis disabled people have always been put on the margins of technology, right? Is it, so the deficiency model around, say, black culture or indigenous culture has been technology will make these people better educated or it will make them more competitive on the job market. <laughs> so, you know, these are destructive to communities that already are suffering from institutional and systemic racism. So being told that it's your fault and that technology will fix it is, is a very problematic. Um, so I think disabled people are on the verge of being the most surveilled population of anyone because every technology that they use is networked, right? You know, records into personal data, um, which didn't used to be the case. So I think it's the civil rights, it's the civil rights movement of the 20, 2020s, at least, to, to me. Um, I, wanna, I wanna dig in a little bit to your, um, one of your most recent projects, Racist Zoom Bombing. Um, I think this is a, a it's a short co-authored monograph, super timely, written in response to COVID mm -hmm. times, pandemic times. Um, and, and trying to make a timely intervention through the writing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you saw a problem and you wanted to articulate it. So could you tell us a little bit more about what inspired you to talk about Zoom bombing and how this relates to some of your earlier work? Yeah. Um, first, I wanted to ask how many people here have been Zoom bombed, just out of curiosity. Wow. Even wow. more than in my class this morning. <laughs> I know. That's a I feel like we need to learn more about this. Yes. 
Can somebody say what happened? Is that okay? Can we ask? Um, so this was like at the beginning of Zoom and the classes were unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no like passcode or anything. Um, and it was like a bio 102 class. And we were just, you know, doing class and then suddenly all these like black squares came in and there was screaming and like cussing and like slurs. Mm -hmm. And the professor just like ended the meeting mm -hmm. and apologized on an announcement being like, so sorry that that happened. We're going to start like locking the class with a passcode mm -hmm. and you're going to have to log in with your pen user in order to like access it. Yeah. And so I think that like started rising like the use of um, the pen user to enter the meetings because it kept happening. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a egregious story to share? <laughs> Sorry to make you run around. Um, so I was actually, I spent my freshman year at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. and in one of my classes, um, similar thing, it was just when we had gone online, and um, like three different people came online in one of our classes and started just shouting racist epithets and mm -hmm. cursing at us. Um, and the teacher just removed those people. But after the class, it was Dr. Sarah Soder Soderstrom mm -hmm. at Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, she was actually, she started an FBI investigation into the people who had um, broken into our class. So she actually took it very seriously. And I think the school helped her with that. So that was maybe a different ending. Yeah. Um, I actually haven't been Zoom bombed. So I wrote about it because I was just looking at what was happening during COVID. I had more time to read news. And I read a story on BuzzFeed that really appalled me because it was a story of a black woman who'd started a supportive organization for women, black women in STEM. And they were there to help people feel some community and some support as black women, um, but also during COVID. And they were attacked. So. Um, it was not hard for us to find a bunch of people to interview. All the people we interviewed were black because the Zoom bombing thing is huge, right? I mean, it could have been a, a really fascinating big study, but we didn't have time to do a big study. <laughs> we had one COVID brain cell each, right? <laughs> so we were trying to do a more scoped study of just what people, black people who were trying to provide community support for st other students or who were writing their dissertations were experiencing. So. We interviewed a man who wrote his dissertation on um, black populations in education. So he was defending his dissertation. They had invited all these people from IT to come to make sure it didn't go badly. His mom was there, his grandmother was there. Someone showed up in the Zoom anyway and started shouting the N word and his grandmother had to hear it. So this is obviously like a, a terrible racial attack. I mean, can you imagine? It, this would not happen in, in physical space. Like if you had a dissertation defense and you invited your mom, you'd be pretty assured there's nobody gonna be there who would do something like that, right? So really kind of egregious kinds of racism were happening and they were targeting black people specifically. So that's what we were interested in. I think the question of bystander racism, like what it means to experience this if you're not part of that group, is super interesting and I think more people should write about that because it's equally harmful and you don't get the experience of even comforting or decompressing or, or kind of processing it because you're kicked out of the Zoom. The Zoom's over, everybody has to kind of walk around on their own and try to figure out how to manage what just happened. So if someone comes into your class and disrupts it, which has happened in my classes, um, I've seen the Proud Boys come to some of our events we all just go out for beers and talk about it, <laughs> you know, and commiserate. So Zoom took that away. People were scared in some cases, taking care of a sick person, and they were sometimes alone, and they had to deal with this. So that was strong motivation to write something fast. Um, we did this because there was nothing else about the topic. That was the other thing. So if you study internet or gaming in particular, um, is anybody playing Axie Infinity or any of these kinds of crypto games? Okay, <laughs> you should write about that. Um, because I think a lot of the most interesting parts of digital culture don't get covered by academics because our cycle is too short. I mean, sorry, too long. So by the time we get an article researched and out the door, that thing is gone, has moved on. So um, one of the 
uh, goals of DISCO is to prototype some rapid writing, co-writing with other humanists around these topics. Because it's not right that everybody but us gets to have a take on this, right? Because often as humanists, we're trained in women's studies, ethnic studies, critical race studies, media studies, and we have, I think, very um, well-informed opinions, but because of the way our jobs work, <laughs> sometimes we don't get to write that way. So I was very interested in seeing how teams of students and you know other PIs could write as equals to leverage the way that students understand what's happening on the ground, and sometimes I don't. Like I just learned about Axie Infinity from from another from a, a postdoc in our network, um, Juan Hay, who writes on games. So if, if we don't have good sustained contact with each other across generations, I don't think we can do this research very well. Yeah, that speaks to um, something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is this uh, idea of the writing process in media and technology scholarship. So you just mentioned that you co-authored Race's Zoom Bombing with two of your grad students very quickly. It's a short monograph. You can sit down and read it very quickly, too. Um, but you've also co-authored another book, Techno Precarious, which is a collective book produced by the Precarity Lab. And as Amanda pointed out, you've been involved in DISCO and some of these other kind of humanities lab building projects. So I wanted to ask you what you think the place of the lab is or should mm. be in research today. That is such a good question and very vexed because a lot of people who have come up in the lab sciences really don't like the lab model. You know, labs tend to be very hierarchical. Um, if you've ever worked in a wet lab, you probably hate your life sometimes because you have to go there every day at a certain time. Otherwise, your stuff dies and your experiment is ruined. So there's a model of the lab which can be very exploitative and, you know, the opposite of collaborative, right? But there are parts of the lab which are great. So I think co-presence is something humanists don't do. Mm -hmm. You know, we go off on our own. We're expected to come back with a golden pearl of wisdom share it with maybe a collaborator as a golden pearl of wisdom, and then you go do another one. Um, we wrote the race of Zoom bombing 100% uh, um, real time on Zoom. And we did that because we wanted to write together. Um, I feel like you learn how to write by watching someone who knows how to write, not by watching what they write and then trying to write the same thing. Like that doesn't work at all. So as a writing teacher, right? Like you can't give somebody, I don't know, you know, a, a Louis Erdrich essay and say, here, <laughs> write like this. <laughs> um, do you think that there's some structural change that could happen in higher ed to support that collaborative model of writing in the humanities yes. specifically? Yes, I do see that a lot. Um, interestingly, as junior people and students who are doing this, there's a lot of co-writing or body doubling going on where people meet to work together and they're not working on the same thing. We just happen to be, but it was the idea of, I guess people call it accountability groups, but I would just think of it as communal working, you know, as an older folk, right? That's what we would call it. You just get together in the student union and do your work together. So um, just because Zoom, you know, Zoom and laptops let you work alone doesn't mean that you have to work alone or that you should work alone. Um, so I think COVID was an interesting push-pull of alone more, but also together more. So being in the same Google Doc or being on the same Zoom when some people live in different parts of the country or have small kids or, you know, for whatever reason, like aren't, be able to, aren't gonna be able to go in person. I wanna push a little bit on this idea of um, new forms and new methods and, and kind of Amanda's to Amanda's question of like, like institutionally, and you mentioned that labs are fraught, mm -hmm. right? And you talk about this in Techno Precarious, the lab is like a, a space where um, knowledge gets produced collectively, collaboratively, all these words that mm -hmm. we have positive mm -hmm. associations with, but also as a, a space of disciplining, mm -hmm. right? In, in the negative sense. Um, and then also how that feeds into the grant funding cycle in the humanities and mm -hmm. precarity, right? Which yes. was the point of the, exactly. pre the precarity lab. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of ask you to tease that out a little more. Yeah, well, labs are instrumental. They don't exist for the well-being of the people in them. They exist for deliverables. So in some ways, a grant is the definition of precarity yeah. <laughs> because it's three years and that's it. So you have to make it work. You, all your employees are temporary employees if you're paying people, which you should be able to do. Um, so I think trying to take the structure of the lab and imbue it with different kinds of values is important. 
So a scientist, first author and second author is very, very important. You kind of don't get any credit for work if you're not in some fields, one of the first two authors. We really wanted to change that, so we didn't publish with our names. We published it as the lab, which I feel was the right thing to do, but is not something that happens in the humanities. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it might have been problematic because if people wanted to look me up or specific people they knew, they might not have found it. So we really fought with the press to have it both ways, mm -hmm. like have it appear in the Library of Congress under our names. Um, for the junior folk, we wanted to have books with their names in them, if not on them. Because I think it's ridiculous that you have to wait five years to have a book with your name on it. I don't think that's, that's right. In your piece on indigenous circuits and elsewhere, you also talk about the erasure of labor yeah. and the problem of erasing the labor that's behind technologies, but we also see this in labs and in mm -hmm. academic work. Can you maybe speak about how to highlight the labor of those who are often erased? Mm, that's a, such a good question. Um, well, the way that labs and grants work is there's a PI, a primary investigator, <laughs> And in the sciences, the name of the lab is the name of the PI, literally. So you could be studying noun technology or birth control. It's going to be Tretin Lab. <laughs> so it's, it's very egocentric. Like it's based on the idea of the lone genius, and everybody's in service to that person. But if you've ever worked in a lab, you know that's not true. Like a lot of the best ideas come from people who have their hands in the materials. So that piece that I wrote was about the people who had their hands in the materials and we're making the circuits because they often are seen as part of a machine and not as part of the human resource of making things. So um, it's kind of a fight to get funding for the humanities, right? Because we're seen as just needing time and water kind of like plants, <laughs> you know? Not like a Lambo that needs special <laughs> gas, but just like, let it sit there for a while. It'll produce something. Um, but I think if we are given resources, we can produce things very quickly. And they can be collaborative in a way that sciences can't be for a lot of reasons. So I think there's a lot at stake in letting the critical, critical arts have more air and more support. Because I think for a while, it's just been that model of let them, you know, just give it, let them sit in a corner and they'll, they'll come back with something. And that does not work at all. Some people can do it, but not always the people who have the most to say. Something really interesting emerges in Techno Precarious for me as I was reading it, which is that there's disagreement between you as yes. authors and you let that texture come into the book itself. Like there will be a little paragraph that says, you know, some of us don't actually take this position, <laughs> right? Like some of us would be more gentle in how we would word this, but we wanted to let the people with the stronger opinion yeah. to like step forward as well. Um, which is, it was kind of, um, it was a new thing for me to mm -hmm. experience in humanities writing mm -hmm. that I really appreciated from that process, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really about kind of milling everything into kind mm. of one pipeline, but instead allowing the difference within a lab to stand in the, in the writing. Um, I wanted to, not to kind of take us back, but um, I want to take us back a little bit to Zoom bombing mm -hmm. um, and talk more about this figure of the troll, yeah. um, which was really fascinating to me reading racist Zoom bombing. I've kind of, I've been obsessed with trolls mm -hmm. because it's a phenomenon that in some ways seems new to the internet. I can't mm -hmm. think of many kind of pre-digital, pre-internet analogs to sp specifically what happens with trolling. But you, you are really careful in that book to distinguish between the troll and the Zoom bomber. Like, there's mm -hmm. something different yes. about Zoom bombing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to ask you more about that. Yeah. You know, the term troll is getting reclaimed by people who are saying they're professional trolls, like Trish Paytas. Do any of you know her on TikTok? And she says that's her job. Like, she describes that as her occupation. So... There's a kind of defiant reclaimings of this. Like, there's a market for this. I supply that market. I'm going to claim that as a job. Um, but, yeah, I think the difference is that, you know, trolling can be rickrolling. You know? <laughs> it can be really innocuous stuff. Um, and some Zoom bombers did do rickrolling, or they just did silly stuff, right? They just went in there and started screaming or, like, making fun of people. But it wasn't virulent racism or attacks on individual activities like dissertation defenses. Or um, there was a student support network that was run out of a 
you know, predominantly black university, I think. And that was targeted by people who specifically wanted to disrupt the joy and the community that people were trying to build on Zoom. So to me, Zoom bombing is specifically about, at least what, what we're writing about it, is the non-innocuous targeting of people who are trying to build a community around solidarity and identity. And so, you know, people, when your students are talking about Zoom bombing, they mention slurs and racism as if this was just an everyday thing. Yeah. Like, well, what else would people do, right? Um, it's completely taken for granted. Um, Zoom bombing was more intimate because it was specifically about activities people had set aside for those things, right? So if you invade a classroom full of students, you're going straight to hell, in my opinion. Like, that's a terrible thing to do, but it's one of the most common forms of Zoom bombing because all of a sudden these poor teachers, poor students are vulnerable. You know, they're out there without really any training and any experience in how to defend this classroom. And Discord, you know, all these other platforms are full of codes, like go to my class and let's see what we can do to piss off my teacher. And they did not know that a lot of the far right were passing those codes around. And they were trying to attack kids and, um, you know, specifically kids of color, I feel, and also trans and queer kids. So that's very different from trolling to me. Like, you know, trolling has a kind of randomness. Mm -hmm. Like when you have a boat and you're kind of dragging that net and you're hoping to see what goes in. Zoom bombing isn't random. Mm -hmm. You know, people generally know where they are. Um, and it's, it's also people in their houses. So people were Zooming from their house. And it's very different to be attacked in your home versus when you're on campus. So um, one of the people we interviewed said that he had not felt safe. He had felt safe in his home. Even though he was a black man at a predominantly white university, he always felt like his home was a place where he could relax. And after that, he said he just didn't feel the same way, which is a terrible, terrible thing, but that's what Zoom did, you know? Well, you know that the consequences of trolling can be very serious, mm -hmm. especially when they get to the point of doxing or, or producing other personal information online. And as someone who brings social media into my classroom, oh. and who often brings these spaces into my classroom, I wonder how can we protect our students or how can we prepare our students to be interacting in spaces such as social media or video games, or as we'll talk about soon, virtual reality, um, knowing that these trolls will exist in those spaces. Can you say more about what you do about that? <laughs> I'm really curious. Uh, sure. For example, um, I've had my students live tweet their readings of novels mm -hmm. um, or participate in live tweeting events um, when authors release a book, for example, mm -hmm. or other um, uh, events, movie releases, things like that. Um, so, and I have a lot of parameters I put in place, mm -hmm. but you can't predict what might happen mm -hmm. right in those spaces. Um, and as my students, I'm sure, who are here today will talk to you about um, soon, I also do have students participate in virtual reality applications mm -hmm. and spaces that are very unregulated. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and we really don't have a lot of protections in those spaces yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I sometimes feel like students could give us a class <laughs> in how to protect themselves because there are a lot of vernacular practices that users have come up with on their own, I feel, to do that. So. Um, you know, the use of pseudonyms or misleading real names, I think, is, is definitely a thing. Um, but I think what I learned from doing this research on Zoom bombing is that sometimes conditions change so quickly that it's almost impossible to get everybody ready for them. So I think that's the opportunistic moment for abuse or for harassment to happen. So I think discussion about what might happen is probably the best you can do. Video games get patched every week, right? Like they get, they get changed significantly without any notice. So something that worked last week might not work now. And as far as I know, Meta isn't asking anybody about how, how they feel about the reporting system, say, in some of their meeting spaces. They just do things. So I think that's, that's the short answer. Like you can only give broad kinds of guidance, right? I'm going to go ahead and move into to speaking a little bit about virtual and augmented reality Ooh. with you. Um, your work, Feeling Good About Feeling Bad, my students here today uh, read in our class. 
And in that piece, you masterfully describe the problem with positioning VR as an empathy engine, pointing to documentary immersions that employ identity tourism and um, what you call toxic re-embodiment for the aims of platform capitalism. So what advice do you have for VR creators who seek to harness the power of the medium, medium to create impactful and activist experiences without reproducing the violence they hope to reduce? Ah, oh, that's such a good question. I'm glad you asked it because I'm just revising that chapter right now for my book. Um, and I ended by talking about the digital diversity complex. You know, the idea that we go to trainings around diversity. Have any of you had to attend a diversity training recently? Do you think that actually helped? I think it did. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, I had this one that's called Jedi. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that. Um, so I had this uh, training called Jedi, so it's called Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Ah. And it was done for engineers, um, and it was this black, queer, disabled woman. Mm -hmm. um, and she was great. Like I, She talked about how for equity, diversity, and inclusion to occur, you need to start with justice. Mm -hmm. um, and actually talked about how to get that done and not to throw the, um, the work onto like non-white, non-male people. And I feel like that's the only diversity training that's actually worked mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, even as a Latinx person, I did not really feel like all the other ones were very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like the embodied presence of somebody who could speak to this from an authentic point of view was really important. Um, I think the disturbing thing about VR is that these are inauthentic points of view, <laughs> and they're there to kind of generate feelings of, of being sympathetic and good and, and feeling sad, um, but I think feeling sad is not a political agenda against diversity. Um, often it can be a kind of distraction. So um, I've been studying a company called Mersion. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Oh my gosh. Um, they got in big trouble for doing something called digital blackface. So they were offering diversity trainings to Starbucks, to Google, to all these big companies on Zoom because all of a sudden everybody's on Zoom and guess what? People are racist on Zoom. Like we already knew strangers are racist, but actual coworkers are racist and sexist and horrible on Zoom. So people were having to deal with a new kind of workplace problem. Um, and uh, Mersion sells this service where you can hire them to basically impersonate a person of color so that you can practice your interactions, the difficult interactions, and get feedback. Yeah. So Doesn't you sound like a good idea. No. <laughs> Somebody, it, yeah. It's super popular. Yeah. And well, maybe not so much anymore because this article was very critical about it. But the idea was, in theory, that you could hire a white person, a white man, to have a VR avatar who was a black disabled woman, and then there could be a conversation where somebody who's being trained says something horrible to that person who then can stop the simulation and tell them that was really offensive, or you might consider saying that a different way. So theoretically, the racism isn't finding its target, right? Right, but there's so many problems with this. You know, A, it's traumatizing to the workers to have to embody some experience they don't know anything about and then basically experience like this weird secondhand racism. Um, but what is it actually teaching people who are doing it is another question. So it seems to be a way of walking around the problem of actually having uncomfortable conversations with actual people of color and being possibly called out, which nobody likes, but there is still really no other way to communicate what racism is other than to call someone's attention to it. So I think call out culture has come to stand for, I don't like that feeling, right? Or that feels wrong, that feels shaming or uncomfortable to me. Um, uh, so I think toxic embodiment is about using a technology to produce a, a feeling of race or gender which is not real and which is ultimately harmful to understanding what race and gender are, right? which are bodies, attached to bodies and people. Could I uh, ask a follow-up on that? Yeah. 
I, I want to ask, I mean, do you think, like, is empathy just something we need to get rid of, right? Like, <laughs> is, it, is empathy a useful heuristic or tool? I mean, it's, it's doing all this work that ends up being, you know, as you describe, kind of pernicious, actually. Yeah. I'm actually thinking a little bit about Jade's work on this. Um, I know Jade's in the room, but, but yeah, like, what, what is... What is the point of empathy? Yeah. Kate, hi. I feel like you should be giving this. You're you're against empathy, right? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm against it too. Can you say why you're against it more? Um, I'm against it because we use it as a stand-in to say what we're actually feeling. Hmm. Like we want to run away from our feelings and say. Somehow there's something inside of me that can know absolutely everything. Um, and I was just talking to my coworker Nikki over there, that's mysticism. Mm -hmm. If you believe that every experience is somehow inside of you, we're talking about something very different. And empathy becomes this shortcut where we get to erase people and say, no, 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 I get it, I get it. Stop talking, I got it, yeah. I got it. And we don't allow for the violent reaction we might have, which can be positive. Like it's okay to be angry and mad and uncomfortable. Yeah, I think empathy is fundamentally founded on projection, which is not a very politically useful technique. So I think empathy takes the place sometimes of rights or of justice or of resources or other things which are more vexed politically for people to give. So if you can give your empathy, that's supposed to stand in for things which people are already entitled to and are not receiving. And it erases power, right? Because empathy is an apolitical um, element or aspect, right? So I think empathy feels virtuous and good to people, but it, it would be better if people didn't have to feel that way, <laughs> right? If, if the pity or the kind of sorrow for another person wasn't even needed, that would be obviously much better. I also want to ask you a little bit about how you use virtual reality in your yeah. classroom. So I had the privilege of hearing you present on the course you taught on VR and empathy at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the potential of VR as a teaching tool in higher education? And if there is time still, I think we have a few minutes, um, can you address the difficulties in balancing the enthusiasm that students have for the technology and the potential career paths in the industry with critical engagement and both with the hardware and the content that the students are experiencing. Yeah, um, I think the opposite of empathy is something like um, community. So uh, I taught some virtual reality, uh, or I've been studying some virtual reality titles by people like Stephanie Dinkins, who's part of our grant, who did um, uh, a piece that's immersive XR about a garden about gardens that her grandmother grew and other black women grew. And it's basically oral history where you walk around this garden and just listen to black people talk, black women talk. And you have to navigate, because it's, it's very tall, it's all these different plants, and you can't see anything. So the only way you can find your way is by listening to these voices and, as they get louder and softer. So kind of literally having to listen to black women's voices in order to just be there, like play the game or whatever. Um, to me, that's the opposite of empathy because you're not seeing somebody in pain or someone traumatized or somebody potentially dying, right? Um, instead, you're listening to stories and having to navigate by people's voice, which I thought was very powerful. So I think a lot of the trauma empathy VR stuff is just problematic for a lot of the reasons we've said. Um, but I don't think that VR is empty of promise, that there's a lot that can be done with it, but the right, the, not the right people, the people I'm interested in are not encouraged or able to use it as a uh, development tool because of the expense, because of the way industry um, kind of turns these things towards certain institutions, probably Penn and Michigan are among those, um, and the industry is not friendly to non-white men. So, you know, it's so unfriendly that Oculus, back when it was before Meta, started a program called Oculus Studio that was just for bankers of color because they didn't have any, right? Like they were being told, where's your pipeline for non-white men? They're like, well, we don't have any non-white men and we have no plans to hire non-white men. So let's start a fellowship program where we take some basically young people of color and give them access to the tool, which is again, like super demeaning and horrible. Um, and so people did it and they were able to make some stuff, but not everybody was able to find a job in industry because industries are about who you know. 
It's not really about who uses the tool, it's about who's your connection. People don't like to hire people they don't know well through somebody they know. So it wasn't producing a pipeline of diverse makers in virtual reality. And I think until that gets fixed, we're just gonna have the same, right? Wonderful. Uh, we would very much like to open it up to questions from all of you in attendance, both here in person and virtually. So please raise your hand. Hi. Um, I wanted to sorry talk about um, your piece about VR as an empathy machine. Um, so in it, you mentioned that algorithmic decision making produces new forms of unfair decision making that fly under the radar as unbiased or aren't considered as decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, so my question is that there is bias that algorithms replicate, but mm -hmm. there's also bias that is removed ostensibly mm -hmm. because there's personal bias that we're seeking to not have present in mm -hmm. algorithmic decision making. So my question is, what is your opinion on, I guess, um, human-based things like rubrics or other methods of standardization mm -hmm. that are supposed to be removing bias, but also similarly are enacted in a way that like algorithms work where, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, you're trying to enforce standards that are done in a fair way for everybody. Yeah, I think automation is, is not taken seriously as something that needs to be partnered with and curated. So a lot of content moderation is done by machine learning algorithms, which are set up to look for certain words or combinations of words, but these almost always return bad results because something like racism is complicated. <laughs> you know, if it were something you could find reliably without using human beings, it'd be way easier to deal with. But, you know, humans are very motivated to find ways also to circumvent algorithms. So using new key combinations, which was happening in Xbox in 2005. You know, um, so I think that, you know, There's no getting around the fact that automation, you know, discrimination, let's just say, is a human activity. So the more complicated or more complex the problem is that algorithms are trying to solve, the more human intervention they need. And when they work at huge scales, like Facebook does, or like Amazon's hiring algorithm did, or so many examples, the scale of error is enormous. So I think these things should never have been automated. <laughs> because they can't be automated. Some things can be automated. Some things that might remove certain kinds of bias, but I think that there's just way too much that is not being handled in a human way, either by humans or in a way that serves humanity. So for the industries to basically hire a ton of people to do this, I think is really the only way. Um, I remember when Facebook said they were going to hire a thousand new moderators because they had so much misinformation. Then it was 5,000. Then it was 10,000. They could hire a million moderators. It would not make any difference because they have over a billion users. So it's just funny to me how the industry throws humanity a bone by saying a thousand moderators. Like the scale of this problem is so big. It's just a joke. Like every time they lose a lawsuit, you know, oh, a million dollars. Fine. You know, so um, that's a long, sarcastic answer to a, a really sincere and important question. <laughs> but I think that you know, algorithmic decision making is complete fail and produces more problems. Yeah. Um, virtuous VR and media, as you described in your "Feeling Good About Feeling Bad" article. Um, can be, quote, occupied by users as a temporary, way to f a temporary way to feel something good, end quote. I believe the ineffectiveness of VR as a conduit for empathy is due to a disconnect between the emotions expressed during a VR experience and the safe, comfortable environment the user returns to when they take the headset off. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can bridge this gap to validate user emotions even after the VR experience is over? Huh, what an interesting question. I think if you were um, watching a VR title that was in a favela, and you were in a favela, <laughs> then that might address that cognitive or dissonant gap between what you see when you have it on and what you see when you have it off. But then the question would be, why would you need the virtual reality? 
right? Because you would already be immersed in that environment. So, you know, what VR like that does is it really curates and makes intrusive something, which in real life you might not be able to intrude on. So if you're in someone's neighborhood and you go into their lawn and start touching their stuff, you know, they're probably gonna stop you if they're there. Um, but VR moves into such private spaces for people who don't have private space that um, it actually encourages a sense of entitlement and ownership um, visually that you can't even have in, in a real space. So um, I think that's a good, actually a good question for a psychologist, you know, what that moment of disruption is and what it does. Because I think it's a productive thing to study and probably has a lot to do with why scrolling on your phone and then looking up, you know, also can feel that way. Um, this is building off a bit of what you just said, but um, you stated that the invasion of personal and private space, that documentary VR titles kind of say for good, quote unquote, um, create actually a toxic empathy, um, problematically re represented in, in um, multiple media texts as like sort of political activism. Um, is there a way that you see that we could use VR in a non-invasive oh, way? Yeah. Um, and if so, how? and um, is there anything being done in this way already? Um, I think the, the very few people of color that I've been able to look at their stuff um, often have a different goal, which might be the goal of cultural preservation sometimes, or even personal preservation. So if you had to sell your grandmother's house and you had a ton of great memories there and you made some immersive VR about that house, that would be actually really awesome, you know? Or places that are kind of destined to be de demolished or moved in some way, that would be a, a really good application for it. And I think real estate companies are using VR because they're finding that people really get a sense of like, what is this space like? Where am I gonna put my stuff? So there are innocuous or, you know, emotionally resonant ways to use VR that don't exploit anyone. Um, but those don't get talked about as much because they're more everyday. They're not meant to produce a kind of sacred feeling of, of sympathy or empathy for anyone. They're just helping you kind of understand space better. So I actually had two questions um, following up off of, off of the last two questions that were asked. Um, first of all, um, we talked about how virtual reality is sort of this space um, that doesn't emulate the real world perfectly and you know that creates some dissonance with the people using virtual reality. So do you think that um, we should be making uh, fast progress towards something like augmented reality? Do you think that offers a much better alternative to um, help enhance you know the, the the aspects that we like from virtual reality while still grounding the people in place and you know in a more of a real life world aspect and then um yeah are your students working on that no, these, these are my students that oh, are talking to you oh i see <laughs> so you're working on ar things yeah we, we do some oh i want to hear more about what that is <laughs> not there yet oh okay okay <laughs> um, uh yeah, I think there's a lot more potential there because there's more, the, I don't know, I don't make any AR stuff, but I think there's more collaborative possibility around that. So it's not about a single perspective that says this is what this is, this is what a slum is, this is what, you know, um, a refugee's life is like. Instead, you have an annotation of something which has an actual, you know, history and a presence. So I think that could be super interesting. Um, and then going back to virtual reality, there has re there have recently been like large um, large progress towards the make or, or towards making cameras that capture a 360 view yeah. without having to be large and obtrusive or expensive, you know, within the hundred price range that can easily be moved around by, you know, different members um, by one person at a time and no need for like all these. Um, cameraman to follow someone around. So do you think that these will, is this like the next step towards being non-intrusive towards communities? Is this how we proceed? Yeah. And if we were to do that, 
how would we moderate the kind of um, content that people would mm-hmm. see? Yeah, I think the potential there is in, in the, the design and the making part. Um, you're reminding me of the assignments I had my students do in the VR class, which was to create a 360 because we didn't have you know fancy VR cameras um, that represented some perspective that you felt wasn't represented often. And a lot of people made them about their dogs (laughs) or their cats or their pets because that was what was handy. And so um, one student said she didn't realize how unhappy, well, she didn't think about what it was like for her dog to be in his crate so much. So she made a a 360 video of what it was like to be in the crate and then to be doing the other dog activity. So she watched her dog carefully and made a 360 video of what she thought his point of view was. And that was not exploitative to the dog. It didn't, you know, in, you know, it wasn't like this fake sympathy. It was rather place taking. So trying to physically see what is the perspective of being three feet tall and being in this space and not that space. Um, they made some really cool stuff. So I, I think if it's about not feeling these special feelings of I'm better than you and blah blah blah, but rather what is it like to be. I think that can be really useful um, as a media exercise. Um, I love how you brought up Trisha Paytas because I feel yeah. like she's kind of the modern epitome of what a troll is. Yeah. Um, but that got me thinking about like Kanye West's current oh. actions. Um, <clears throat> and I'm curious to know about what you think is like the line between trolling and like exhibiting behavior that is genuinely harmful. Yeah. Oh. I don't know how much time left we have <laughs> to talk about that question. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes Trolling is actually people who have mental illnesses of various types, right? And one of the sad things about social media is that there's so little care for people and the condition that they're in. You know, there's a lot of leveraging of attention. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to say about Kanye West. Honestly, um, in 2018, the New York Times called me because they were trying to understand what cancel culture was. They didn't know. And their example was Kanye West in 2018 because they were confused why the black community was canceling him because they thought, well, he's black too. Like, why are you canceling him, right? So they were trying to understand what disapproval in the digital age means and how people are representing it. So um, I think um, trolls exist on disapproval, right? Like that's the kind of fuel that keeps them going. So, I don't know. Do you do you have any things to add on this? Not on Kanye. <laughs> oh, what is, what's the new what's the new drama? Oh, I <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious where the question's coming from, right? Because yeah. this is kind of what I was getting at with with you know what's the difference between trolling and something that's more pernicious? Is there actually a line mm-hmm. there, right? Because my sense is that a lot of what is happening in something like Zoom bombing and the the kind of racialized terror that mm-hmm. it is. Is, is an extension. So it's like, is, it, is there a hard line between the innocuous Rick rolling mm. and the racist Zoom bombing or what Kanye is doing? Or is it just an extension of this kind of 4chan mm. red pill culture mm. that has become like it's gone viral yeah. today because of the way that TikTok and you know, can can turn people who are the most extreme mm-hmm. into stars. Kanye is a weird example because he was already a star and then he like, he red pilled himself and you know and is poisoned himself and has now kind of been canceled so he's a a, he's like a fringe case study but there's this more mundane way right that that has entered into the discourse more generally yeah Yeah. one of my favorite examples of like kind of this maybe positive trolling or or trolling that's kind of like you said reclaimed is the way that dictionaries have been posting specific words at oh. specific cultural moments oh. right um, i mean miriam webster and and dictionary.com will tweet specific words right at the height of a of a debate on that platform that kind of makes their 
makes their case, <laughs> that makes their feelings, their political leanings known. Um, and other publications do this as well. I mean, whitehouse.gov, right? Oh, they, there was so the intern good. who was doing some really interesting work with their Twitter feed uh, recently. And I find that absolutely fascinating, mm -hmm. almost like the, the subtweet mm -hmm. <laughs> that, um, you know, the, of that, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my voice, that kind of official Twitter yeah. um, handles have been um, using as they don't directly enter the conversation, but they're able to control or like or or move the conversation yeah. through their use of the platform. I love that example. This is the one where um, some of the pol politicians who are against student loan redress were having their own loans retweeted. There are loans that have been defaulted or forgiven. So I think the line between roasting and trolling. <laughs> Is, is a thing. And so for a while, I remember the right wing, um, the kind of 4chan group were saying, the left can't meme, right? I mean, the reason we're winning is that we're funny and we know how to use memes and the left doesn't know how. But I see that as like a really good use of kind of counter speech or, you know, talking back to something like that. A great example of this was the Women's History Month. I forget the name of the Twitter handle, but every time a company would say, you know, go women, they would retweet it with something that it went into their data and said exactly how much women were paid in the company oh. versus men. So kind of exposing what a, far, like the, what a farce this is, that social media has become a space where companies can just pretend like they are, you know, in line with Black Lives Matter or say it, right? But what does that discourse to this idea of this conversation we've been having about rhetoric, right? What mm -hmm. does that actually mean mm -hmm. when your company's paying women 35% of what men are making or something? Yeah, wow. You know, um, I just had a memory of MySpace. You guys are too young to remember. Um, Jessa Lingle might remember MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> Jessa, yeah. Jessa and I remember MySpace, Craigslist, all those like legacy ones. And um, Tequila Tequila was the most popular person on MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. And she also red pilled herself. Yeah, she did. She became like a kind of Richard Spencer fan. And so, what is it about this path from like internet notoriety as a kind of troll ish person who nonetheless had the most popular reality dating show ever, the first bisexual dating reality show ever? Like, she was a Kanye of that genre. She wasn't a talentless nobody, right? But then, the way that the descent goes is towards grabbing onto attention through the most horrible means possible, which is identifying against, you know, identifying with this racist, fascist thing. There is something going on there, because that's not accidental. Uh, we actually have one more quick question from the chat. Uh, this is from Maddie. Uh, I really like hearing about the rapid writing approach and the collaborative writing sessions you organized. Would you share more about the structure of these sessions and the participants involved? Yeah, I would love to. So um, did any of you meet up with friends on Zoom to do homework? Some, a lot of people did. Why did you do it? And what, what was it like? <laughs> Can you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I met with my friend who's actually a psychologist to uh, write papers together. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we, we set, we are nerdy. We set up an um, Excel sheet uh -huh. and just, um, put what our goal is today, mm -hmm. what do we have accomplished, mm -hmm. how much time we spent, mm -hmm. and what do we each would spill our labor because we work on the same Google Doc. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss a little, like, what are we going to write, and then write for 30 minutes. Seeing each other writing sometimes can be anxious, sometimes yeah. can be motivating and inspiring. Each session is different. So that's actually very helpful. We, we don't actually work... Um, besides the time we met. So uh -huh. we spent half a year meeting once, um, just for two hours every week, writing a paper. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But I don't know, like your, your practice is rapid writing. So that's actually also the question I want to ask. How do you do it fast? <laughs> we were <laughs> so slow. <laughs> well, that's exactly what we did, though. That's exactly what we did. So I think in the spirit of no one having to feel bad about not doing it, we only did it when we were together. So no homework, because everybody felt bad already, right? Like it was COVID, no one knew it was happening. Everybody felt bad already. So 
only writing together, and also not counting words at all. So if everything I wrote got deleted, I was still equally a partner, right? Because the labor of deleting it. <laughs> and sometimes writing is about deleting. Absolutely. So writing some first draft that's crappy and that gets completely deleted is 100% a contribution mm -hmm. to the final. So you did a lot of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I had a writing accountability group completely on Zoom, and we did Pomodoros. If any oh. of you know that method, it's where you you know, set a timer and write for a certain amount of time, and then you schedule in breaks that you yeah. have to take. They're enforced breaks, which I think are important. Um, but I, I borrow this term for, from the composition rhetoric world, but we called it ink shedding. Oh. Right? So you're literally just shedding ink, whether that be with your actual pen, right, or online. And the idea is just to get the ideas down. You're just shedding the ink. I mean, it doesn't have to stay. You can definitely delete it or erase it. But hey, you've gotten something down. And if one sentence is good, you're coming out ahead. Yeah, I think the word counting is really hard for people. And so if you're just going, you're not t keeping track, right? right, or looking at anybody else, you're just kind of going as you go, that's a speedy method. So I think there are methods which are faster than others, like giving permission to just go and then fixing it later. Um, but uh, it was really important for our group as well not to divide up the work in that way. Because that way, if you didn't want to do that job, you would not want to do it anymore. You know, people showed up and did what they felt like they could do. So if it was transcribing an interview or analyzing an interview, but if someone didn't want to do that, someone else would do it. So as the oldest person, I tried to do what no one else wanted to do. So I wrote the glossary for Techno Precarious because mm -hmm. nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> um, so I think that's the role of the senior person is not to be the supervisor, but to just do the things that other people don't want to do or can't do, either because they don't have the experience or because they're out of gas. So, you know, people get tired. I think that's the other thing about your method is you have to take a break. Just take a break. Even if you hate what you're doing, you know it's over in 20 minutes, right? Or 25 yeah. minutes? Yeah. Do you think some of these writing techniques and styles should be baked into graduate education differently or put... Or does it put pressure on graduate education to change in any way? Or do you see it kind of easily being incorporated? I think graduate education is designed to produce a huge amount of depression and isolation. <laughs> Not to dissuade anybody who's thinking about going to grad school, <laughs> um, but the form of the dissertation is a single author, very long-term project that is so big and so huge, I, you know, hardly anybody ever enjoys it or looks forward to it, and then you get to do that more, and it's called a book. So you spend two years feeling, feeling guilty about doing things like going to the gym, talking to friends, or watching TV. Like, that's no way to live, right? Um, but the other problem is that you can never pursue other lines of inquiry. So if you're a curious person who likes looking at multiple things, like I do and like everybody here probably does, you're asked to ignore every impulse towards pleasure or novelty that you ever had. Right? So you're told, you can't do yes. that because yep. blah, blah, blah. You can't do that. You can do this other thing. So I think if you have collaborative, rapid writing, you get to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't do it in such a way it, dis it, it takes away from your dissertation. So if you have a team that writes for 10 hours, right, maybe two hours for two weeks, and you write a 10,000-page thing, you get to really think about that thing. You get to have something out and you don't feel like you're, you're stealing from yourself. So the worst thing about the dissertation is the feeling that you're both stealing from yourself and you're being stolen from, right? Like you're, <laughs> it's such a sad conversation. <laughs> and um, murmurs of assent. Yeah, I, yes. Know. Yes, I know that. Yeah, what do you think would have been helpful for you? I actually wrote my dissertation using the Pomodoro method. Oh. But one thing that I find funny is, and all of you can do this, if you just Google like, should be writing memes, oh, right? No. There's like every celebrity on earth's picture with you should be writing, you know, um, my favorite is Tim Gunn because I'm a Project Runway oh. fan, right? But you can find any any person that you relate to. Um, but the thing that I wanted to get to is that actually something long like a dissertation mm -hmm. or a full-length monograph isn't read nearly as much as no. shorter pieces are. So that's the other thing. You could be putting your energy into a, a shorter article or a digital project that actually would get more you know, cultural currency than a longer piece anyway. That's true. Like the, the racist Zumame book was so easy to write in some ways, 
there were no published academic sources, so we didn't have to read any. <laughs> Seriously, if you write on something really yeah. new, some people say, oh, I get to be first. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter who's first. It matters who did a good job, right? But it makes it faster mm -hmm. because you don't have to do research <laughs> the same way. Like you do research, but you don't have to do that kind of research, right? So like no one puts out a Shakespeare article and doesn't read. Like there's just thousands <laughs> of things to read. In our field, there's nothing to read sometimes. So you just have to plunge in and do your best. But yeah, I think that um, making something someone will read that's topical, that you don't do by yourself, that you can do pretty fast, those are all good things, but the academy does not know how to reward it, and it doesn't know how to scaffold it. So we got grants to do that because our universities aren't doing it. So, yeah, Penn is bursting with money. Maybe you all could, <laughs> you know, these are not expensive things to do either. It's mostly time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, I think we're actually out of time <laughs> now. So please join me in thanking Dr. Lisa McNamara for joining us. I know two people in the audience. What a coincidence. <laughs> so nice. Thank um, you, Heidi. Jade is coming to dinner. Oh, good. Yeah.